marvelous seas. They have come from near and far. We thank you that they have laid aside many things they could have done. And they're here. Shikala bahati talabahaya. Some people seem to have a gift of missing everything good, but not these people. They're here. They didn't pile up excuses, they just came. We thank you for it. Now, Lord, let the waters run high and let them run deep. Shabaha. And change and transform lives. That from this moment we can say, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. That it will be a memorial we look back upon and say, we got it. Remove every hindrance. Open every heart. And bless. And all the people said? Thank you. You may be seated. The Lord bless you. I'm very happy. Uh... In a few days, we'll be sending our C-130 Hercules back into Europe, uh, this time for Albania. Albania with over 30 or 40 years of dictatorship. Their dictator raised his hand and told the world two or three years ago that they were the only country on the face of the earth that did not have one Christian in it. They were the single country that had no Christian in it. Well, he's dead and in hell. There are thousands of Christians there. They're all over the country there. And we're sending them food because communism grinds you into powder. We've been negotiating and working with great old sailors in different parts of Europe for this food in the last week or two. And we're ready to send that great giant of mercy into action and feed those people in Jesus' name. We know that our plane can't do it. It only takes about 30,000 pounds at a time. And so we're filling the ship down in Lake Charles, Louisiana tonight. It it holds 10 million pounds. And we're going to really go after them. I'm going over. The president has invited me to come over for an audience with him and has given us an auditorium to preach in. And so we're going over to bless that country. The devil thought he had it. The devil lost, just like he always loses. <laughs> Hallelujah! If Yugoslavia settles down just a little bit and stops killing each other, We'll take the food over there and we'll feed them. In fact, we'll just go right up into Scandinavia and that that part of the world and refill that ship and bring it back down into that area. Those areas ought to be Christian. They've never known a revival like you know revival. What you have seen tonight, that country has never seen in its lifetime, you see. You can't imagine that There are certain areas that have had revival and revival and revival, and some have never been touched in their history. Well, we got a scripture in Acts 2, 17. In the last days, saith God, I pour out my spirit on all flesh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That means Albania. That means Yugoslavia. Pray for us that we'll do what God wants us to do. Thank this church for giving so liberally. And thank all of you that are part of the great Feed the Hungry program. The Lord has said in the last days there's going to be a mighty and gathering of souls. And that it had to be accompanied with food or you'd never get them. Never get them. Angola and Africa has a revival now that it didn't have a few months ago. We took them a boatload of food and also a complete hospital. It'll be the nicest hospital in their country to give it to them free of charge. We sent some young men down to get the meetings ready for me to come. I was down there a few weeks ago. They faxed back and said, we're doing pretty good, I hope. Says we baptized 7,000 people in the South Atlantic Ocean yesterday. I said, well... 
Yeah. You don't have to do it all. I'd like to do a little myself, if you don't mind. A couple of weeks later, before we could get there, they, they said, well, we're doing a little better now. It says, yesterday we baptized 10,000 people in the Atlantic Ocean. The young man that came out of Portugal, we said, hey, go down and rent an auditorium and get ready for us, please. And he went down and rented the biggest thing in the country, seating 14,000 people. We had nobody, of course. He put out the ugliest handbill ever, ever put out. It said miracles, 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 and then gave the address of the, of the stadium. The first night, three or four hundred there, and they all got healed. Next night, three or four thousand there, and now you can't get in there. God has given them revival. Hallelujah! We certainly thank God for Brother Parsley and his family and his, his, his workers here with him. May God bless them all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of hard work that goes along with everything else. Uh, hearing about it don't cost you much, but you ought to do the work. It's interesting. And we thank God for them, and we thank God that all over the face of this earth today, God is doing great things. Aren't you glad for it? Oh, hallelujah. Tonight my message to you is entitled, The Preacher Married a Prostitute. I mean, he went and got her out of the red light district. He found her in there and got her married. The reason I'm preaching this to you because I feel we have enough people here to change this nation. Yeah, we got more than Gideon's 300 here. They saved the nation. If we can get it through to you, we can save the nation. The first institution upon the face of this earth was the home. And in these last days, the devil is determined to destroy the homes of America and of the world. I have a new syllabus that just came out called World Family Targeted for Death. Targeted for death. You see, in what way are they targeted for death? Well, divorce. That destroys a family. Over the half of the marriages of this country goes to the divorce courts. And the devil sits back and laughs like a hyena. You know, that's the way he destroys. The home is the cement of society. You move the cement, it'll fall down. So it holds it together. And then abortion destroys a home. They kill it before it gets there. How in the world any human being of an average intelligence thinks it's all right to kill little children, I don't know. You have to have a crooked brain upstairs. Got a corkscrew for a brain. To think you can kill a you say, well, when is a fetus an immortal soul? Well, when it's conceived, of course, stupid. <laughs> Thou shalt not murder. Homosexualism is against the home. How can two boys produce a home? I'm glad the roosters don't know about it or we wouldn't have any more eggs. I hope they won't ever become rooster sexual. I'm glad the hogs haven't gone along with it or we wouldn't have any more bacon. And if you let that bunch go too far, you won't, you won't have any human race. Yeah. The lust of the flesh bring death. And then we have so many enemies of the home. We have the motion picture industry built to destroy the home. They can't have a three-way love affair. They can't produce a picture. 
and, and so they are destroyers of the home. Crime destroys thousands and thousands of homes. AIDS is destroying the homes. I've seen on television a woman says, I will not live with that man anymore. They found out he's got AIDS. I will not live with him. He broke his own home up, you see. And so we have so many things. I got them listed down there. But in this teaching syllabus here, we, we have, uh, what are the deadly destroyers of the home? Ten principles of marital bliss. Ten family hurdles. How to stay married. You say, what do you know about it? Well, my little girlfriend's down here tonight. We'll have been married 49 years in just a few days. The first thing you have to do, you have to do this real quick or you get out of it. Uh, the first thing that you have to do is remark because they say that an artist will never finish a picture. You have to drive him off of it. That he will forever paint on the same picture. If somebody don't say, well, just stop. You, you, it's not looking better. It's getting worse. And, and if you'll see my teaching syllabus here, it's already ready for a changeover. Because this very chapter that you're going to study tonight used to be called Unfaithfully Yours. And I looked at that and I said, that ain't strong enough. But the preacher marrying a prostitute seems to be what I want to talk about. And so the first thing you'll have to do is change the title of that, of that, of the lesson that we're going to give you tonight. You should study on how to save the home of America. It's the most important thing we got. And you, 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 we have 18 lessons in here. Go after them and read those scriptures. And you'll see what we're talking about with this one here. All right. I'm going to read from the book of Hosea. So if you, if you will uh, uh, keep your hand up if you haven't gotten yours. And uh, if you have to, throw your shoe at one of them. He'll give it back. And he'll, give you, he'll also give you the book. Verse 1. Keep your hand up until you get what you want. The, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, who was the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel. The beginning, say beginning. This is in verse 2. And the beginning... Of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto you a wife of the whoredoms. You go marry a harlot. And of the children of the whoredoms. For the land, now, now, now you're getting to know something. For the land hath committed great whoredoms, departing from the Jehovah. Now, that's the story. He had to be the living picture of a nation. Isn't that something? When they looked at him, they had to see themselves. He became a mirror. A mirror. Huh. That when they looked at him, they saw a nation. In the Old Testament, the Bible says that Israel was a wife of God. And that this wife had betrayed him, this country called Israel, as a wife. She had betrayed him and had gone after idols or whoredom. And in order to get their attention, say attention. It's so hard to get people's attention. To get their attention, the number one prophet had to have in his home the condition of that country. Boy, I tell you, I, I think I ought to stop preaching. I don't think I could have done it, you know. Look at verse 3. So he went, and he took Gomar. She was the daughter of, of Dibna, 
Dibbler Lim. Boy, I tell you, I, I think she was too. I'd have called him Nimcompoot. <laughs> and which uh, conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel, for yet a little which little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jew, of Jehu. And I will cause to cease that the kingdom of the house of Israel, that's when they went into Babylon, will cause to cease the entire nation of, of Israel. And it came, and it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And so his wife, Gomer, conceived again and bare a daughter. God said unto him, call her name Lorahama, which means having no love. No one cared for her. I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Whew. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Jehovah their God, and I will not save them by the bow, nor by the sword, nor by the battle, or by horses, or by horsemen. Now, when she had weaned Lorahama, she conceived and bare a son, and God said, Call his name Loemai, which means no kin or no relation of mine. Now, <laughs> why didn't Hollywood pick this up sooner? They sure put out a lot of lousy stories when we got a good one here. Here was a young preacher with the first touch of God upon him named Hosea. And when the first touch of God comes to a boy preacher, ooh, he walks about 10 foot high. He feels that holy anointing going through his being. And he is so happy for the future of winning so many souls to Jesus. What a wonderful thing. Hosea called of God to be a prophet of God. And then God spoke to him and said, boy, you know where the red light district is down here? Yeah. I want you to go down there and to marry a whore. <laughs> Devil, you get behind me. <laughs> How could God be saying things like that? He said, would you say it again, please? <laughs> yeah. He says, I want to show you something. When this nation looks at you, and you say the words that I put in your heart, they're going to see their condition. Talk about a movie theater. God created one, and it had one actor, Hosea the preacher. Did you know the world has always had the same amount of gossipers? For every three people, there are two. Here goes Hosea, dressed like a rabbi. He was a rabbi. Black hat on. Black coat down to here. They said, there goes the preacher. Where's he going? Oh, 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 he's going to the brothel. He's going to the red light district. Don't tell anybody. Give, me, give it to me. Let me tell it. I saw him go to the red light district. That preacher boy, I tell you, all this exhorting us to live right. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Some preachers have had it rough in life, you know. Jose was one of them. With all the idealism of a young minister, Rising up to change a nation. And God says, go marry a whore. You sure, Lord? 
yeah, I'm sure, go do it. So he starts off for the land of the prostitutes, crooked and mean and cruel. What's he doing looking at all these harlots? Why don't he take one in the room? Didn't come for that. You, Gomer, stand up. Put on some clothes. I'll marry you. Oh, everybody heard it. Did you say you were going to marry me? Yeah, God told me to marry you. What God? The only one up in heaven said to marry you. Oh, well, I'm sure living in a preacher, a preacher's parsonage ain't bad. A lot of food, a lot of clothes, a lot of nice things. Yeah, let's go. He came, he came out of the red light district with a prostitute on his arm. And the neighbor said, has our preacher gone crazy? Any girl in the kingdom wanted him. Handsome. Amazing speaker. He didn't have to have a slut. <laughs> he took her to his house. He went to the great square, and with a sonorous voice, he said, People of Israel, God told me that you had committed whoredoms, that you were worshiping idols. You're the wife of God, and you're worshiping idols. You're kissing Baal. You're falling at the feet of these dumb things that you've made. You have committed whoredoms. He told me to choose this woman to show you who you are and what you are. He's married to you. He's married to you. He's married to you. Gomer got to the lovely preacher's cottage. She says, I've never seen a place so nice. Prostitutes don't have a very good time. She says, uh, it's going to be nice here. I think I'm going to like it. You don't sit, hit me side the head, do you? Well, that's the way they do down there, but when they don't like what I'm doing, they just crack me one. No, he said, you won't be hit here at all. Oh. You got plenty to eat, do you? Oh, yeah, plenty to eat, yeah. yeah you, you got plenty of cloth to make clothes? Oh, yeah, sure. Ah, she said, this is going to be all right. So she hurried around to put the house together to try to be a wife. And he went on one of his preaching tours to preach to the nation of Israel, telling them what he had done because God had commanded him to do it. To reveal to them who they were and what they were. They looked at one another and said, this is the strangest preaching we've ever heard. I think Moses would turn over in his grave if he heard this boy. <laughs> he returns home and when he gets inside, Gomer says, uh, what you going so long for? Well, he says, I have to go to that city and that city and the other city. I have to get the message out to the whole country. But I don't like staying around here by myself. He says, in fact, it seems to me like you're a bunch of screwballs, you religious people. I haven't had any wine lately either. He said, no, you're not going to get any. I haven't had a boyfriend either. He said, no, you're not going to get any. She said, well, I'm unhappy. Do you know the beginning of breakups in homes is a misunderstanding of what you got into and not enough love to heal it? 
knowing that divorces only cost two fifty, and he'll have to pay it finally. Discontent is a devil. Discontent is a wicked thing. You can take discontent and put it under your feet and stomp it to death. It has no right to live. A contented spirit is a great thing. Paul says, I was content whether I bound or whether I was abased. He didn't go around grumbling because he hadn't had enough food. You know. We've got to learn that discontent cannot master our lives. I don't like this. I don't like that. Don't like this church. Don't like the other church. Honey, you won't even like hell when you get there. (laughs) Discontent is a terrible thing. It's the beginning of the breakup. He said, let's pray about it. She said, pray nothing. I'm mad about it. I thought this was going to be sweet and lovely and you were going to stay here all the time. We were going to have a good lot of fun together and, uh, and you've been gone too much. And besides, by the way, these religious leaders that come and look at me every day here and wonder if I'm going to make it. So tell them to stop coming around here. No snooping. Discontent is a miserable thing. But God looked down upon this situation and he did something about it. At the top of your page 25. Hosea's bitter destiny was to to live before Israel their true spiritual conditions revealing in the nation during his life showing them what was prevailing within themselves. And he had it there. And his dramatic life opens up astounding everybody. Astounding everybody. And then it's a number four here. Gomer becomes dissatisfied. Thoughts give birth to acts. Acts give birth to habits. Habits give birth to character. Character decides the destiny. She grumbled. She pouted. She was sullen. And he didn't know what to do about it. But at the top of page 26 here, at the period of time, Jezreel was born. And God told him what to name the kid. Said, name him Jezreel, and the meaning of it is coming judgment. I mean, like a name like that. Here comes Jezreel. Just don't play with him, boy. You know what that name means. Yeah. Let's not have anything to do with that boy. His name means coming judgment. Stay away from him. He had a hard time. Jose hoped, say hoped, that the coming of a little child would bring joy into their home. He believed in it. But he soon discovered that the flaming passions of Gomer, with her desire for the ways of the world, her for the craving of the music and the dance was so strong within her that she sought many sensual indulgences. That's in Hosea 2 and 7. She sought for many sensual indulgences. He begins to pray about it. Point six. He begins to pray about it. And God said, Hosea, This is what happened to my people Israel. They became discontented with me. They said my religion wasn't what they wanted. That when they worshiped Baal, they could all get drunk, take off their clothes, and lay with any woman that was there and have a good time. And that this religion here is just, just too good. He said, I want you to go and tell the people The judgment is going to come upon them. And so here he went. Said, look at me, everybody. I'm Hosea, the prophet of God. Look at me. I I married a prostitute because God told me to. Because you have prostituted the great religion of Jehovah God. And now she's unhappy. And says, God said that you got unhappy with worshiping him. 
She finds fault. And God says, you find fault. That the pagan religions give you so much flesh. All the flesh you can take. And God says, live holy. And he preached the family story in public. It must have been a hard thing. It must have been a difficult thing to expose his inner life, to expose his home life to a whole nation of people to go off and laugh about it. He hoped they would repent. He was preaching a message of divine repentance. Quit it. Stop it. Turn around. Look at me. I am a photograph of you. I'm a mirror. Look and see yourselves. And a nation. He was their last great prophet. <laughs> and he told them, you will cease to be. You'll be driven to the four winds of the earth if you don't love and serve God. Number seven. Laura Hama was born. She was a girl. And uh, he says, now we got it. <laughs> we got it now. She loved this little girl. Looks just like her. She'll stay home now and take care of this little girl. Everything's going to be nice now. How many times we hope our country every two seconds has a crime. Our country at the very bottom of the whole world and all kinds of wickedness and dirtiness and filthiness and AIDS and everything else. And we're supposed to be the bride of Christ. He wants us to be the bride of Christ. He wants us to be ready when he comes. And we're doing exactly the same as it did in the Old Testament. Exactly the same. When Israel was the wife of God, she was an adulterous wife. Full of iniquity. Full of sin. And this poor preacher had to stand up and say, look at me, everybody. This is what you look like inside. This is God's picture of you. Very soon after Laura Hama was born, here was a mother who strayed away. She went down into the red light district again, and all the girls said, hey, thought you got married. Oh, yeah, I'm married. Says it's pretty dull. Said, I'm used to having four or five men a night, not just one in a week. Says, pretty dull. Said, give me some liquor. I hadn't had any liquor in a long time. I had the old bird don't even believe in drinking good liquor. And when he would come back, those sweet neighbors of his would say, you know what she did while you were gone? Says, I saw her so drunk she couldn't walk. I saw her half clothed and so drunk until there was a man on each side and they were drunk too, wobbling down through the red light district. Is that right? Yeah. Well, sir, preacher, you ought to do something about it. Oh, thank you. I'll pray about it. You see. I, I doubt that people who've never had the, the real call of God understand or know the burden of being a man of God. You know, the stress that comes inside of you sometimes. The, 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 the desire to see so many people changed by the power of God. And you meet people that are so hurt that you hurt too. The pastor's wife in Zimbabwe was in a state of deep depression. I had to bring her out of it. She's out of it now. In Canada, pastor's wife hadn't been to church in a year. So depressed she couldn't stand it. And I had to bring her out of that. She's as normal as anybody here tonight. Full of joy and full of blessing of God. Give the Lord a hand for it. But, but it takes a toll on your insides. You can't do it without deep sincerity. You can't do it without deep anointing, you see. God needs more men who are willing not only to stand up and talk, but stand up and suffer. 
were the people of our age, were the people of our times, were the nation like America. Communist Russia begging for Bibles in America saying you can't bring one in my school. They fire teachers for reading a Bible at their own desk in this country of ours. How could we get so stupid in one generation? And every move they make is a blow at the home because they know that the security of a nation is in the home. The stronger home you have, the stronger country you've got. And the blow is to destroy the homes of our country. We must fight more for the home than anything else. God save our homes. He heard these awful stories of his wife. He didn't sleep with her anymore. She had her own bed now. And a third child was born to them. God said, name him Loami. Loami means no kin, no relation whatsoever of mine. She had produced a child in harlotry. He had to go to the people and say, I have judgment, I have unloved, and now I have harlotry. And he says, that's you. You don't love God. You're headed for judgment. And all these idols that you're married to, that you serve, and all these dirty, filthy priests of paganism, Leading you to hell. Look at my family and turn to God. What a picture. What an awful picture. He preached and he preached. One day, wiping the perspiration, he came down the little path to the preacher's house. There were the three children. He said, hi, dear one. So nice to see you. I'm home for a while. It is so good to see you. Where's Mama? Oh, we don't know. She hadn't been here in a long time. Oh, what happened? We don't know. She took her clothes and, and left. Oh, who f- cooks food? Oh, the neighbors, they cook food for us. Who puts you to bed? Oh, the neighbors come put us to bed. Oh, and she's gone. He sat down and he wept. And God said, get up from there. Go into the plaza and tell my people of Israel they're gone. They're gone from my temple. They've gone from my presence. They've gone from my love. Tell them your wife has gone to the whoredoms and so have they. Nobody can preach like a preacher who's gone through it. Yeah. Yeah, that's gone through it. That's tasted the bitterness and knows how to talk about it. And he preached to that nation. Oh, his neighbors, wonderful neighbors, just like yours. They were so glad to tell him Oh, I saw it over here, and I saw it over there, and I saw it down yonder. Ooh, I tell you. And he bowed his head. God would speak like thunder inside. Go and tell Israel. They're running after this idol and that idol, this mountain, that valley. They're running to worship evil, and they will be condemned, and they will be damned. They all knew his story, the sad story of a preacher who married a prostitute. And he said, that's Israel, it's not me. I'm only the picture of it. 
I'm only the mirror that reflects you. Maybe America needs some preachers like that today. We've got enough televangelists that are just playing around with the game. We need men who weep and mourn. We need those that will cry out against the sins of our times. They tell me that in many churches, they don't preach about hell anymore. It's just a wee bit unpopular. You better tell the truth because that's where you're going, you see. So it went on. For how long, I don't know. But the bitterness was terrible. And every time he, he parked his old body for a little while, God said, go tell it again. Israel is just like your family. Away from me that I loved and bought. I bought her. She is my wife. She's gone. One day sitting on the porch. Point number 10 on page 27. One day he was sitting on a porch and something happened. In number 11 it says what happened. A neighbor came. Good neighbors. <laughs> you could do without some of them. They came and said, uh, uh, Preacher, uh, what was the name of that wife you used to have? Gomer. Oh, that's what they said down there. Down where? Oh, there, there, there's a woman being auctioned off for the highest price. Down in the square here. But says she, she looks awful. Her hair is all down. She has very little clothes on. She has no shoes. Her head is down. Some big guy says he owns her. And he's auctioning her. He's selling her right now. And you say her name was Gomer? Yeah, but I don't think it's your wife. But anyway, I just want you to know about it. Preacher put on that preacher's hat and that preacher's coat. And here he went. He got down to the plaza and on a stand about that high was a woman with her head down. Are you Gomer? Yes. I am Hosea. Yeah. What in the name of God happened? He says, this man says he owns me and he's selling me now. You say that that don't happen today? <laughs> it's amazing how ignorant the whole of America is. And most of the world, when you get a girl, you bring big offerings and gifts to the daddy. Or you don't get her. Oftentimes, he parades it through the streets in Cairo, I saw it on the back of a truck, and I, and, I, and I saw it in a wagon. What he was giving to the father for that girl, you see. Most of the world, India, Africa, you pay for the girl. You don't get her free. He don't feed her for 15 years free. You pay for her. It's called dowry. And sometimes you stay broke for 10 years paying the thing off. Dowry. I personally, in the great hinterland of Asia, have seen many slaves, not, not a few. And every horse in where we slept at night, there'd always be a slave girl doing the menial work there, cleaning toilets and things like that. And I went to a slave market. They said that was the day. They, one day a week they, had, they sold slaves. And I went to the slave market. Personally, and I saw them sell little girls. The cheapest one that day was about 75 cents American. She wasn't worth much. She was stunted and about this big. The best one that looked the strongest sold for about seven dollars and a half. And those men grabbed those girls and let them out of their slaves until they died. Women ought to serve God. 
He's all that keeps you out of slavery. When he looked at her carefully and said, you are Gomer, my wife, she said, yes, I am. The preacher took off that hat and said, ladies and gentlemen, a word to you, please. I am the prophet Hosea. This woman that's for sale here is Gomer, my wife. All of you know my story, my pitiful story. That is a good, clean man. I went into the red light district and married a whore. And God told me to do it because you were such a dirty bunch. And he, he is the father of the husband. And you're supposed to be the wife. And he said, we've had three children together. And she lived an evil life. And finally, she ran away from me lived in the whoredoms of this place. All of you evil men sneak out on your wife and you've laid with this woman. And God said, you worship your unclean images. You worship, worship the God of Baal, has ears, can't hear, eyes, can't see. A head with nothing in it. And now I'm going to show you how much God loves you. I'm going to buy her back. And I don't want a one of you to come against me either and outbid me. He turned to the auctioneer and said, Sir, all the money I have in the world Fifteen pieces of silver. That's half the price of a slave. That's all I've got. I don't have another cent. And he said, I have an omen, one omer and a half of barley in my barn. That's all I have for the winter. My children must eat. And that's all that I have. I'll give that too. So that I will have no money. And I will have no food. I will give it all for this woman. The whole value would come up to around $36. That was a big deal. That wicked auctioneer glared at him and we said, we'll see. Who will outbid this friend? Who will do it? I need more money than that. And I don't care for that grain. And there was a great hush. And nobody said a word. He was angry. He said, if you don't bid, I'll close it. One who will bid. And then the hammer went down. The gavel struck hard and resounded all through the area. People looked at one another in stark silence. He said, two! And the cabal went down. And the people looked at one another. And nobody bid against him. He was angry now. His eyes were flushed. He said, three! Take the bitch. Everybody gasped, and they saw him reach up tenderly and help her off the, the stool where she was standing when she was being sold. And he said, uh, Gomer, it's a little chilly. <laughs> Take my coat, honey, so you'll be warm. And he put his arm around her, and they walked down the lane toward his house. She got up a little courage, brushed her hair back away from her eyes and said, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Oh, she says, I know. 
It was your ministry. You're trying to redeem your ministry. You're trying to get back at the people. He said, no, I didn't think of the ministry. Oh, she says, I know. It's those three little old kids. You want them to have a mom. And you want me to come back and be a mom. You thought of those kids. He said, no, I didn't think of the children. Just why did you buy me back? He pulled her a little closer and said, because I love you. I love you. No one else loves you, but I love you. She didn't understand it. They got to the house and there were the three children. They said, what you got there? What kind of a thing is that you got with you? She had been gone too long, you see. He moved his coat from her and said, Darlings, this is your mother. This is mama. She's come back home. She's going to love all of us. She's going to be a good mama. She says, I know she looks bad right now. We'll go in the house and she'll take a bath and and, and she will comb her hair. And she will put on some new clothes that I bought for her, believing she'd come back. And he took her back into his heart. God said, preach it quick. Preach it while you feel it. And he ran out and said, God wants to buy you back. God wants to buy the whole nation back. He would give all. He would give all he's got to buy you back. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to buy America back. Oh, America, full of sin, full of the lust of the flesh, full of ungodliness, turning to stupid idols from India and other parts of the world. God is ready to buy you back. He's ready to take you into his arms. He's ready to love you. And I'm his mouthpiece. And I'm his mirror to reveal to you God does love you. He still loves you. He loves this nation. He doesn't want this nation worshiping other gods. He wants you to worship Jehovah. Love knows no limits. It'll go all the way. Love unites broken homes, broken hearts, and broken countries. We have one message for this great land of ours. On this Independence Day, come back to God. Come back to God. It was a wilderness for thousands of years and God protected it and kept it for you and me. Why should we have the whoredoms on our TV screen? (laughs) Written in the pornographic books and magazines. Why should we do it when he loves us so much? He loves us so much. He will forgive us of our backsliding. And then he adds a note, if you don't, Jezreel will get you, judgment. Laura Hummer will get you, I'm loved. And lo am I will come, we'll break off the relationship, you'll be no, there'll be no 
There will be no relationship at all. You will be children of adultery, doomed for hell. Don't do that. Don't do that, America. Come to God. I think the most beautiful moment to come to God is at this Independence Day. Come back to Jesus. Those 57 men that signed that declaration were men of great courage. Their necks were on the line. Men of great devotion, they wanted to see a nation born that loved God. And we need more men like that today. And we need more people like you that will come to God.